This is Coda Radio, episode 451 for January 31st, 2022. Hello, friends, and welcome into Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly talk show, taking a pragmatic look at the art and the business of software development and the world of technology. My name is Chris, and joining us every single week, perhaps right next to the barbecue, it's our host, Mr. Dominic. Hello, Mike. I am cooking up some shrimp on the barbie tonight. Ooh, that that was bad. That was bad. <laughs> that was real bad. You know, when you try to go Australian, it's it does. When you get a boomerang in the mail, a dead fish with wrapped around a boomerang. I'm like 10% hung over this morning, but I think that was pretty bad. Only 10%? Yeah, I did pretty good. You know, we had the meetup at the studio last night. Uh, that's right. Folks came in before we started Linux Unplugged. We did a little uh, meet and greet, did the show, and then did a big cookout. And people stayed till about 8 p.m. It was a good group. You know, what's super common is there's usually always a good portion of coder fans at these meetups. With their M1 Max, yes. That did happen. Yeah. Uh, Jose came in from uh, Puerto Rico, Oh, which is incredible. He's visually impaired, too, so it's even more impressive that he manages to make it all the way up here in the Pacific Northwest. He's he's a brave man, and I'm going to visit one day. So he came up from Puerto Rico, so he's probably the furthest away. He's like, yeah, okay, all right, I got to get going because I got a project I'm working on, and he's going to use the whole flight home <laughs> to, work on his, to work on his project. Uh, so that's pretty great. Sounds like he's working a lot in Python these days. But, yeah, just a lot of, a lot of people came in. You know, They wanted to see the space. I showed them my photo album of you. We talked about you a little bit. You, I'm sorry, a photo album? Yeah, you know, I like to print them out, you know, because I used to have them just on an iPad, but it just feels it feels more special when we can sit there and flip to them together, you know. Mm. Some of them I just made up, so, like, I just Photoshopped you into a couple of them, but... Uh, how many of these are of the Phantom Menace? Like, the bulk of them I did back then, but I updated it recently before the meetup, just because, you know, people want to see that. People were disappointed that I didn't have Lady Jupes parked here at the studio. Because, you know, nobody knows what to expect. When you, when, when you say you have a podcasting studio, that could be a closet, right? It could be something like the MKBHD massive warehouse that he has that is totally too, too big. But what we have is it's a townhouse that I used to own. Then, well, I still own it, but I, I used to rent it out. And my renters moved out and JB moved in years ago. And so it's a house that has spots that are dedicated for recording, right? But it, it's just a house. So nobody knows what to expect when they get here, which is great because they're, they're just completely unaware. So they, they thought like Lady Jupes would be parked here and I'd be giving tours of the RV. <laughs> but no, we weren't able to do that. Maybe at a future meetup. But it was a lot of fun. People brought a ton of food. So now I don't have to grocery shop for like the week because people left what they brought. So there's like basically an army's worth of cookies here still. That sounds like a party. See, one day I will make it up to the Pacific Northwest. One day when we are, not only are we like traveling again, but maybe Linux Fest is back. That, that'd be when I would head up here. One day. Just as it's getting nice at the end of April. Mm -hmm. Yeah. First of all, we got a couple of emails, but you know what? Audience, you got to be sending us more emails. That's a big part of the show. You know, if you don't send us emails. Get out of here. Then there's no show. Show just we just pack it up, we come on, we say thank you to our sponsors, and we put it out in the feeds. And uh, so if you don't and send us emails, that could happen. So you got to go to coder.show slash contact. If you've been thinking about it, because now's the time. Inappropriate? It is not. But we did get an email in from listener Chris. And he writes, a little while ago, I think maybe it's actually quite a while ago, Mike mentioned that he rewrote a Ruby service in C++ for performance. Oh, blessed performance, he says. I'm curious to know what prompted Mike to do so. Was it an observation by Mike and his team? Was it a client complaint? Was there something that was just taking way too long? He goes on to say, I don't want to say that I have a similar problem at work, but I have a similar problem at work. And I'm curious to know what the thought process was and the steps taken in order to implement such a change. Thanks so much. Great question. Yeah, so uh, both, right? So the version of it that was written in Ruby was kind of, we've got to get this to market, get it to ship for the customer. And uh, we knew it would be slow. We did a little bit of monkeying around with the optimizations. But at some point, the level of voodoo we were doing to try to speed it up in Ruby was silly when doing it, quote unquote, the naive way in C++ and just compiling it as like a native, you know, like a .o file that we just called was significantly faster. 
Now, when I say significantly, I mean fast enough for us, which was pretty fast. And it didn't require like the craziest Ruby code you've ever seen, right? It was pretty straightforward because we could do all kinds of thank you, the compiler for yield optimizations. I don't think this is that big of a, a crisis type war story because it's something we knew was going to be slow. We just shipped the slow Ruby version because we had to, we had a deadline. And when it came down to optimizing it, we tried for like a week to try to optimize it in Ruby, but it was actually me. I did a quick, simple, like just command line app in C++ and literally just put it in the, in the slash bin of the Rails app. It was like, look how much faster this very, very bad version of the C++ is. If we even wrote some like halfway decent a C++ application that could do this, that our Rails app can call, that solves all our problems and we don't have to, you know, sacrifice a few puppies to Cthulhu to get this to work. The Ruby wouldn't work, right? It was just slow to get it work performantly. That's what happened. Maybe like a thousand lines of C++. Later, we haven't had to touch it. I don't know. It's been like maybe eight months, nine months. What I think I just heard in there is it kind of sounds like when you originally created the Ruby version, you kind of knew in the back of your minds, we should probably come back and readdress this. And so when it came time to look for low-hanging fruit, that was one of the first places you looked. So this was a specific UK use case for this Rails app that had to do like this one weird thing with this weird pseudo proprietary mapping file format. You know, the whole time going in, it was eyes wide open, right? We knew it was bad. We had, but we did it. The customer was okay with it. Then we came back and fixed it. We quote unquote fixed it, right? We just, you know, made it faster. I don't know. The more I work in Ruby and Python, specifically Python, the more I'm struck like these are all just like, all these libraries, these gems, these pit packages, not all, but many of them are just wrappers over C or C++. And this might just be like old curmudgeonly Mike here, but I just don't think it's a huge deal to call into a lower level language for performance reasons from one of these high level languages. When the majority of the time, I'm thinking particularly now with the new thing, with the new version of Alice, the challenge is like figuring out like what the weird hitches in her reading the data structures, not necessarily performance. But certainly when performance is an issue, there's just obvious benefits. There's a million Python uh, kind of, pi- we'll call them compilers, but million Python interpreters that are like super fast. Now, right, there's one that runs on .NET that we covered a couple months ago. There's uh, there's ways to compile, transpile Python into C, C++. I don't use any of that stuff because I think that's a little too magical for me. I guess, Chris, my thing is I don't think this is that crazy of a use case. So yeah, I mean, if, if for the for the for Chris who's writing, consider it. I, I seriously would consider it. Now it's got to be like regular vanilla C plus plus, right? But yeah, it works. It's good. I think it's a smart thing to do if you need it. I mean, other things can be hindering your performance, though, right? So if I'm looking at let's say a Rails app or a, even a, like a Flask or Django app, the first thing I look at is not this type of performance thing. This was just because we were dealing with graphical mapping files. Obviously, like the first thing you look at is database, right? You look at Active Record or SQL Alchemy, because that's almost certainly where you're going to hit most of your bottleneck in those type of applications. And that is not solved by just rewriting something in, in, a, in a more performant language. That's a good, well rounded answer. I like that. There's a good question, too. If you're listening to the show and you hear us discussing something and you want to know the thinking behind it, that's a great kind of email to send in coder.show slash contact. I'm going to mention it again because we need them. We did get a comment via matrix alex wrote on free software funding he said i was thinking about the funding issue over the weekend one of the aspects of funding i'd like to see is trying to get funding targeting open source software for end users i think getting corporations to help pay is great but i often think the type of corporate common software that is useful for huge companies and the types of software that's good for us users is quite different if funding came from users or end user distros I think you'd see different kinds of open source software get built. I kind of like the general premise here. It's something I've been thinking about too. And I I feel like you could kind of talk me down a little bit probably. I think what we need in order to get even the fraction of the healthy desktop software ecosystem that Mac OS has. And if you think about it, Mike, like how big of a market could the pro Mac user who's willing to spend money on things like rogue amoeba software or bartender could that market really be that much larger than the enthusiast desktop Linux market? 
it just seems to me that there is a lot of software on Linux that doesn't have a cloud angle that a vendor isn't going to be able to sell their server product by investing in. So it never really gets a lot of long-term investment on the Linux side. And if there was a way for users to directly fund, and, and, and this would have to be a way that allows practically anyone in any country to fund because you'd need the net to be so freaking wide. It couldn't just be like U.S. users or Western users because you're only going to get a tiny fraction of people that actually participate. So it's got to essentially be a net that includes the entire world. But if you could do it, you might be able to get a few decent long-term desktop Linux applications if you could crack that nut. I grant you there are millions of more Mac users than desktop Linux users, but I wonder how many Mac users there are that are savvy enough to go buy these third-party apps to modify their Mac experience or have a special note-taking app. That's got to be a, what, a 10% of the Mac user base, maybe even less, maybe 5% of the Mac user base, which has got to be somewhere in the spitting distance of the desktop Linux enthusiast user base. But I'm, these just could be way off. Yeah, so I think I think there's a couple questions, right? The the general size of desktop Linux users versus Mac users. I don't have any data on that. I I know, you know, we always laud that Linux has been gaining, but I, I think it's gaining not at a huge pace, right? The other thing is I think there's just a cultural difference. Folks on the Mac kind of expect to pay for things. Folks on Linux, and I know this is like broad generalizations will get me hammered a little bit here, but in terms of desktop, like, you know what, folks on the Macs will will pay 10 bucks for like a little cute utility app. That just doesn't happen on Linux very much, right? I once purchased from the developer a piece of Linux desktop software and tried to, re, you know, repackage it up, clean, clean it up a little bit and resell it. And uh, yeah, that, that, that dude only made a, enough to buy a cheeseburger. And that's why he sold it to me for not that much money. And uh, it's it's a hassle. I, I just don't, I think it's a cultural thing. Now, I think there's money to be made in the Linux world and that, and I think all that money is on the server. I do agree that right now that's, that is true. I do, I do agree. And the, the only like crack in this, what has been a wall of truth for a decade now that I see is Steam and, and things like good old games, GOG. Like you have you have a growing demographic of Linux users who are willing to pay like $60 for a video game. I wonder if that user base grows and just general Linux grows. Perhaps we are going to see ex-Mac users, ex-Windows users who are more comfortable paying for software or people like myself who I run a business. So if a piece of software helps me do my business, I'm willing to pay for it. Like that user base has to be growing, but there's no mechanism to monetize it well well okay hang on there, there's a big so if you want to compare like people who buy stuff from rogo amoeba you, you need to compare them to people who buy that type of utility software not not to gamers right there's a lot of mac gamers who have ps5s and xboxes and play games on mac yeah i suppose that makes sense yeah i suppose because that's one's gaming it's 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 leisure it's entertainment and the other is like utilities and working Right. I mean, is is there, I mean, I guess, I guess the question we end up really wanting to ask, but it's a bit awkward, is why isn't there the Ubuntu, you know, or whatever Linux version of a Panic software or Rogue Amoeba? Why is that not a thing? That's got to be a hundred different things, right? It's got to be Shifting Sands, GTK, X11, Wayland. It's got to be, you know, different, different changes in a young ecosystem. And then it, I think... I'm trying to argue against your cultural assertion, but I, I, I think that could be part of it. That definitely seems like part of it. I struggle with it because I, I, I really do believe that if you make it, like it's like the iTunes model, right? Like what Steve Jobs recognized is if we made buying music easier than pirating it, on average, people will just buy the music. Yeah, I don't think people are pirating the software for Linux. I think what it is is it's always, right? One, one of the big benefits of Linux, in fact, is that for much commercial software that you might buy on mac os or windows there is an open source alternative on linux now this is less and less true as things cross over where stuff is also free on mac os and windows but i remember back in the day we're talking ubuntu like 904 910 days uh what was it called the uh everybody uses it now oh my god the graphics tool is it blender oh blender yeah sure that's huge, right? And that was just like a, such a OBS, right? Open source. I'm just saying, I don't know. And when I say it's culture, I don't mean I'm not like, you know, trying to denigrate folks. It does seem kind of true. And it, 
And I do think in a way it's it's really super beneficial for so many parts of the world that this software is available and free to them. Like they couldn't afford to pay for it. And I don't feel like using it as piracy, but there is, when you said that, that it, part of me feels like, no, but it, I do kind of consider it piracy of the developer's time. Like never, ever giving them anything in exchange for years of work just isn't sustainable. So it's it's so funny though, because there is no Mac server software to speak of, right? I mean, there is Mac OS server, but it, it's kind of a, joke no mostly you install docker right you, it, <laughs> and then you run it that way <laughs> so it, it's kind of like i don't know I, I see lots of healthy businesses especially like enterprise software tools that people are licensing and selling that are effectively built on top of linux and work and it's great i just don't see your you know your boutique and the other problem would be with and this is i know this is where you're definitely in trouble with the uh kind of fragmentation of the desktops one of the things that mac users who buy because remember, we're talking about a small percentage of Mac users here, too. Most people who have Macs don't know anything about Panic, don't know anything about Rogue Amoeba, and they would be damned if they ever paid those kind of prices for a little stuff, right? For a small, not little, but, you know, independent software. But the reason people do buy them is because those two developers in particular, and many of the, you know, your classic Mac OS software vendors, are committed to doing things, quote, the Apple Mac way, right? They quickly update when the user design language, user UX language changes, they follow the trends, right? Monterey comes out, they make things look more like Monterey, they clean it up. I think you'd be hard pressed to do that on desktop Linux, unless you just said, I only do like KDE and only do KDE Plasma. And if you customize it, my app's gonna look weird. I have to say, even kind of then, like we're seeing this on the GNOME side, some apps that really try to stick with where GNOME's going. But what seems to be happening over the years is that an app stays strong for a while, then it kind of fades and just a replacement eventually comes along. And it's kind of like a reset of the whole application, sort of re back to basics, kind of like when Apple like threw out an app and just restarts it over again and has very limited functionality. That seems, we kind of seem to be in a cycle of that on the GNOME side, in my personal opinion, not completely, but there are definitely some apps that just seem like we've done this before, but then, you know, now they're reimagined in the new design paradigm. I find it to be a problem that I think you would you would hate this answer, but um, all of your buddies over in the Web3 camp are solving this with their tokens. This is what these tokens do. They have governance tokens, and these tokens allow you to have so special status, or essentially they fundraise projects by selling these tokens, which is a total like you know securities nightmare and could potentially be abused in a Ponzi scheme. But that's where they're trying to go with some of these coins and tokens is a revenue model that doesn't involve selling something like a product, but selling a token, like a, a like a almost like a stake in it, like a stock in the project. And uh, some of them are uh, po have potential and some of them, you know, don't. But that's, I think, why some of this is gaining traction. There's so much hype in that Web3 camp right now is because the one thing they have solved is money. <laughs> they got there's a lot of money over there. And they're not asking how do how the hell do we fund these projects over there? That's not that's not the problem they have. I, I can't say it's a better way to go, but they solved they solved the funding problem. Speaking of funding, did you see that Sony announced that they're buying Bungie? I did, and then because you have to clap back, right? Wow, that was quick. Yep, that was. Uh, I, I Destiny is a good game. Destin, so now they they've they've got Destiny. Well, and ironic, so, right, ironically, Bungie was the original developer of Halo, which was originally supposed to be a Mac OS game. So we're full circle here. It's pretty wild. Sony says that Bungie will remain an independent subsidiary. This is crazy. Only they only paid $3.6 so they paid like nearly $60 billion less. <laughs> well, Bungie is not Activision. Yeah, for sure, for sure, for sure. And Sony's already in a pretty good position. Destiny is a great, great, great game series. So snapping that up is is actually pretty brilliant. Linode.com slash coder. Go there to get $100 in 60-day credit on a new account, and you go there to support the show. It's Linode.com slash coder. Just remember that URL. I was just talking to my friends over at Linode, and I got a little inside scoop on what's coming next, and you guys are going to absolutely love it. I can't tell you about it yet, but you know I will. You know I will. I absolutely love this company. I mean, I'm just so damn impressed as a customer, but when I talk to them, and I hear about what they're working on. I'm super excited about the future of Linode. You know, they started in 2003 because they just loved the technology stack. They saw what 
they think they could do with this. You know, who knew back then, right? And now over 18 years later, they're the largest independent cloud provider in the world with 11 data centers around the world. But they really have just kept focused on building the best cloud computing platform to make it simple, affordable, and accessible to all. Maybe you've been doing this for 20 years, or maybe this is your first project. Go try out Linode. They've got great documentation, the best customer service. Their performance is excellent. Their dashboards are easy to understand. I'm used to like working through those kinds of things, but what impressed me was how the team has just wrapped their heads around it. Anyone who's wanted to get into it, even people who've never really set up a server can understand that interface. It really is pretty great. And they got one-click deployments for some of the best open source applications out there. Maybe you're ready to move to your own GitLab instance. Linode can make that really straightforward. And their pricing is 30 to 50% cheaper than those huge duopolies that want to lock you into their crazy interfaces with their crazy terminology and processes that are only applicable to that platform. It's just kind of gross, really. And then Linode backs it with tons of great features and services, stuff that makes the computing experience even better. Bulletproof backups that are easy to understand exactly where you're at or kick off another one with status updates on where it's at. Cloud firewalls, S3 compatible object storage, VLAN support, DDoS protection, a powerful DNS manager, and much, much more. So go check it out. I can tell you about it all day long, but you got to experience it. And that $100 really does let you try it out. So go to linode.com slash coder, get $100 for 60 days on a new account, and you support the show. Linode.com slash coder. During the Epic versus Apple lawsuit, I don't know if this made it on the air. I think it did, but maybe it didn't. But we definitely discussed it off air. It looked like Apple was implying that Microsoft was behind the scenes giving Epic lawyer time, emails, information to help Epic win their fight against Apple. And Mike and I remember we, we both saw this and we we're like, this is a weird thing for Apple to claim. You remember that little exchange? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, it seemed a little odd. Well, it turns out it was true. Now we know because 35 U.S. states led by Utah and Microsoft have officially thrown their weight behind Epic's appeal. And in addition to that, get ready for this. The Biden administration is also joining this pack in the appeal against the Apple versus Epic decision. That's an allegedly neutral party, though, right? Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> Where the federal government and White House leads, Microsoft always follows. This has been a very common thing. Have you noticed, like with the whole TikTok thing with Trump, when it comes to the Pentagon stuff, there is a real tight connection between what the White House wants and what Microsoft is willing to do. And I've noticed that for a while. So it's no accident, I think, that this has been going on. This is fascinating. So you've got these 35 states, Utah at the top. You got Microsoft and the Biden administration, supposedly being neutral, that are all now gunning, along with Epic, that are all now gunning for this appeal. I'm just kind of taking all of this in, trying to figure out, like, what's the end game here? Because they're not going to stop with Apple, right? It's going to they're going after Google. So Microsoft is kind of using the very system that came after them around Internet Explorer, hobbled them for a decade plus, and now has made them a compliant lapdog of the federal government. Microsoft is now using that very tool that was probably an awful experience for them to go after their two biggest competitors, Apple and Google. They're taking the machine that chewed them up and now... They're turning it against their competitors in what is a absolute killer move. I think this is right here showing us that Microsoft has not lost its teeth. It's just been doing more kind of behind the scenes stuff. But now with everyone's cards on the table, they had to put their name out there because they had to go in on this appeal. They were perfectly happy remaining a silent player in this. Even though Apple's lawyers did try to out them, it just never got any traction. And still no one's really talking about it. But it's right here. Foss Patents has the filings. And it all started because they wanted to slip an app store into Fortnite. Epic did. Yeah, well, and Microsoft wants Game Pass. I think that's what pissed off Microsoft and got them involved. You sound like very excited about this. Uh, I think it's going to be a hell of a fight. 
has Apple raised the cost of software to the end consumer? Or cost to be raised? I would say it's caused the soft cost of software to be lowered. Then you're beat. In the United, you're beat. That's it. You got nothing. Right? In the, in the EU, you've got something, but you know, you know how we feel about the EU. You got nothing in the United States. Antitrust is, did they raise, did pri- cause prices to go up for the consumer? Yes or no? The answer is no, because they've basically destroyed small, you know, development jobs. You're done. Right. They, they have all they've done is taken value from independent developers. Now, if a law were to be changed, that would be different. Right. If Congress got out of what I can only consider its 30 year bender, <laughs> maybe they could do something and sober up for a day or two. It, it's funny because I, I keep reading these stories about Apple and I am very much on the side of this is horrible. This shouldn't exist. If I understand what I'm reading about the law and what kind of very, very smart, you know, like legal analysts are writing. Apple's mean, but being a dick is not illegal. It's just not. Right? Being super powerful is not illegal. I, I can see that. And I, I, I think what the what the hope is is that new precedent or new law gets created as a result. You know, some Congress critter wakes up, but uh, so Tim Cook calls Nancy Pelosi a few more times. Yeah. So I I also struggle to actually understand what Apple did wrong here. I wish there wasn't a green versus blue bubble thing that they had iMessages for Android. I wish they had third-party payment options for the App Store. I wish they didn't take such a commission, right? But I also wish that Walmart let me buy music that has swearing in it. It's their store. They make the rules. That's always been the case. And even just this quarter, they weren't the top phone maker. Samsung took the top spot for smartphones in 2021. For, the, for 2021, Samsung has 20% of the market. They sold 272 million phones. There are more Samsung phones than there are iPhones, and Samsung is just one brand of Android. So I don't buy the monopoly argument here. I, I just don't buy that. And I also don't buy that Epic's the victim. They knew the rules of the store. I don't like the rules, but they knew the rules of the store, and they shipped an app store in their crappy gaming app. So I, I feel like what's happened here, and I really hate to say this because it makes me sound like I'm defending Apple, but I'm just telling you at, like I see it. I think Apple built the best product. Yep. They brought a lot of customers and now the losers are trying to use the legal system to punish Apple, but Apple didn't do it by like how Microsoft did it back in the day where they bullied OEMs into shipping windows and internet Explorer and threatened to break them if they didn't do it. Right. Apple didn't pull those kind of moves They just built a good product with really strict, clear rules that everybody understood up front. These are the rules of the land. And consumers responded to that. And for some consumers, it meant they can now install apps on their phone without worrying about it being malware. Like, that's a huge game changer, right? Yeah, I absolutely agree, right? So so my thinking on all this Apple stuff has evolved. There's two types of Apple, let's call it dickery. There's kind of accidental dickery or like kind of petulant degrees. So for instance, I consider all the stuff where like, oh my God, a formal app, Apple engineer's app is on the app store. But you know who really cares about that? Pe- indies, people like me, right? That doesn't matter for the mass market because, okay, they did their friend a favor, they featured their stuff, whatever. And there's accidents, right? Where the rules are a little vague and like one reviewer sees it this way and another sees it that way. And sometimes things get approved and then not approved or you can, you know, I've had those awkward back and forths. But that's like just incidental in a way that's kind of well it's a huge app store there's always going to be some failure rate think about think about our own code right there's always some percentage of functions that are buggy the other kind is they're not making a mistake they're doing it on purpose because it's their business model i would just call it uh you know looking out for themselves i mean they just got another pissing context with uh what was it is it denmark or netherlands yeah yeah and they don't care right because they're in the business of the App Store. In the 80s, we decided to change the standard, right? Robert Bork, you should listen to The Verge if you don't. You learn a lot. And uh, this standard has changed. And on the existing standard of what a monopoly is, they are certainly not a monopoly in any way, shape, or form. And they have not caused prices for consumers of software to rise. This is my thing. And while I... 
I wish it had to be an open app store. I wish I had to, I could sideload. I wish that iMessage wasn't a siloed platform. I, I fail to actually understand what law they broke. And so where I kind of begin to backslide into, and I'd love the audience's thoughts on this is maybe, maybe I'm missing, maybe they did break some law here, but it seems to me like what we're saying is if you just do a really good job, become super successful, ultimately corporations will work with the government to come after you to take some of that success away. And so you kind of get punished if you break the law. And you kind of get punished if you don't break the law. There really seems to be no difference. In fact, often it seems like people that break the law get away with things for longer. All they've done here is build a platform that has a lot of users, but they don't even have the majority of users. What they did was they, they did what Apple always does and what every luxury brand does. They targeted the whales, right? They targeted the people who are actually willing to spend money, frankly. It almost goes back to our Linux desktop conversation. But also, Apple also has like been screwed in cases like this, not legal cases, but they had a lawsuit with Qualcomm about uh, the uh, antenna, L L L LTE antenna licensing. I recall, yeah. And because Intel was so shitty, <laughs> this, is not a, this is a true story, so shitty at making the parts that Apple needed. They ended up having to settle with Qualcomm, right? They bought in, they bought this division of Intel's modem business, settled with Qualcomm, because it, th th this is a problem I think I in the past and and many of our listeners have. At their scale, it it is not about like their feelings or emotions. It's a business. So did Apple want to pay Qualcomm stupid percentage of the phone? No, that's why they sued them. But when Intel couldn't deliver, guess what? They sucked it up, Sally. They paid Qualcomm and they bought the people from Intel kind of as a hedge. Intel continued. Why are there no NVIDIA MacBooks anymore? Well, the story is that in two... Uh, I might get the year wrong so we can correct it next week. I but think it, it was like two, 12 or 13, was it? Yeah, it was 12 or 13, one of the first aluminum MacBook Pros. Might have been a little earlier. The NVIDIA chips overheated. I had one of these all the time. And NVIDIA would not pony up for the repairs. Though Apple got pissed and decided they didn't want to deal with NVIDIA. But guess what? They did that because it cost them money, right? They didn't do it because they were... Right. They paid for the repairs. They wanted NVIDIA to help out, and NVIDIA refused. Right. They took care of the end customer, myself included. And, you know, so I don't know. I mean, I also, like, as much as I would like to see the app store open up, it, it's real unfair if we can go back and retroactively change laws and say that, well, this thing that was okay, uh, even though it's kind of shitty of you, is now not okay, and we're going to go back and punish you for what you did before, even though we said it was okay. I mean, how can you do that? You can't, I feel like you just can't unring this bell in a way that isn't like pure, straight up, you know, Big Brother comes in and literally says, or we'll throw you in jail. It does go back to our discussion about Linux desktop users being will, willing to pay, because when you're a business and you're looking at markets to address for your product, you consider those kinds of things. And Apple has decided, and they figured this out a while ago, we're going after a percentage of the market that is willing to have a credit card on file with us all the time. That's like a baseline for an Apple customer. You got to have an Apple account. You need to get a form of payment on file. That eliminates a good percentage of Linux users right there, right? But they know what their demographic is. So they build a product that will sell to that demographic. And they realized that the App Store could address an issue that has traditionally plagued large platforms like Windows. And thank God they did, because it would have been a nightmare if they hadn't. And so they built a product with the App Store that involved that crappy review process, that involved sandboxing. But at the end, it meant you could pop on an app on your phone like it's candy and try it out. They trusted these things, so they'd be willing to try out some app called Candy Crush and install it on their phone. And that changed the market. They truly did innovate in that regard. And the market rewarded them for it. You know, I, I, I keep like, and I know I've, I rail against the App Store all the time. I, I struggle to see what a better system would be like for people who are effectively like our non-technical family members. And I'm sure we all have them. Because for us, fine. Yes, I know how to like, you know, make go, go into my Discover card app and create a one-time use credit card number if I'm on Joe Blow's website, right? Fine. Honestly, I don't want my mom to be able to input a random credit card into a into an iPhone app. I just don't. Right? I think it's bad. And she's a pretty technical person, but I you know, I don't want, you know, my dad in his late 70s doing it. 
right? There's a reason you're not seeing independent developers blogging about the glory that is the Amazon Fire app store. Because <laughs> it's a piece of <laughs> Windows Phone, my beloved, my, my beloved. Failed. Because you know what, what, why Microsoft failed? Microsoft was really good to developers, really bad to customers, right? Microsoft worked with the carriers as partners because they're also their customers. Where Apple... Apple's big innovation, I would argue, forget the APIs. They always say it's the APIs. Screw the APIs. The security stuff, you can make arguments against it. It was getting the carriers out of that transaction with the end customer. Yeah. It was saying no to Verizon. Like Java ME was a nightmare. You might get, what, 5 10% of your app, and that's if the carrier and the phone manufacturer, the only way to do it was really to have your phone pre-installed, unless we want to talk about Palm. And if you want to talk about Palm, I, we can, we'll cry about WebOS together. It's fine. <laughs> but we, like, I don't know. Should they have this, this quote, control? It made the difference, right? I had, a, uh, I had a Sprint Android phone that would get push notifications about sp- football team wins. There's nothing I could do to remove the app. Oh, I, I, I had that on my first. My first smartphone was a Verizon Droid. Yep. And it really, really thought I liked football. Yeah, same thing. Yeah, and I... Did not care at all, and I kept getting push notifications about it. And that's when I realized this really matters. This really matters. And that was an innovation, and it did change the market, and it did get them a lot of customers. We're never going to be able to educate the average Joe user, Joe or Jane user. You know, I, I think one of the mistakes a lot of us in our in our community make is a lot of the things we just take for granted as like, oh, of course you have 2FA on, right? <laughs> like, naturally. That's a big hurdle for a lot of people, and that's just one instance like, I don't know, if not them, then who? I certainly don't want, again, like my my dad or mom or whoever's like cell phone to be as open as a Windows PC. You know how many times I've had to reinstall Windows? Or Android, to be honest. Uh, they don't get Androids. Android doesn't exist. I legitimately bought my mom an iPhone and just said, here, mom, take this. I cannot handle this. She she, I, she lost her all of her pictures twice on Android. She's just had, so, she had years of issues. And she just kept going in and the carrier would just like sell her on a phone. And it was always the Android phone. And it was an absolute disaster. They they give her just an unbelievably cheap phone that had maybe 16 gigs of storage. It's just painful. So I eventually just bought her an iPhone and said, here, mom, just use this. And it's been great. Your mom could drive to an Apple store if there was one by her and be like, hey, my phone's not working. And most of the time, they'll just fix it and with very little questioning. Right? Datadog.com slash Coder Radio. That's right. When you go to datadog.com slash Coder Radio, you can get a two-week free trial over at datadog.com slash Coder Radio, and you'll receive a free Datadog t-shirt as well. Datadog is the SaaS monitoring and security platform you've needed. It gives you full stack observability for developers, maybe your IT operations, security, the business team. Everyone can get full visibility, even in the cloud age now. And Datadog's platform, along with over 500 vendor-backed integrations, allows you to correlate your metrics, your traces, your logs, and your security signals across your applications, your infrastructure, and your third-party services, all in a single pane of glass. The capabilities that this gives you, combined with the drag-and-drop dashboard and the machine learning-based alerts, takes it to the next level. It lets your team troubleshoot and collaborate more effectively, which means you prevent downtime, and it also just means you're going to enhance performance and reliability. That value is huge. And so as an exclusive offer for Coder Radio listeners, go sign up for a two-week free trial at datadog.com slash Coder Radio. Get yourself a Datadog t-shirt and check this out. It's beautiful. The dashboards explain the entire thing. Datadog.com slash Coder Radio and happy monitoring. The iPad, however, not doing so well. iPad sales are down. Mac sales are up. iPad sales down. So Google feels like tablets are the future. Google says that they're focusing on tablets. They've staffed up a new division. We believe they say the future of computing is shifting towards a more powerful and capable tablet. We're working to deliver the next chapter of computing and input by launching seamless support across our platform and hero experiences that unlock new and better ways of being productive and creative. This is great. It's 2011 again. Everything's awesome. I mean, I love this. This is how I knew this was going to be awful. They are doing the thing that they did originally where they're going to take the current version of Android and fork it for tablets. It's Honeycomb part two. They're doing the same thing. Yeah. So they're going to have Android 12L, a mid-cycle release of Android that's dedicated to tablet functionality. Oh, 
if they won't learn? No. Why won't they learn? I can't believe they're going to try this again. They have job openings for it, and they uh, also want to develop relationships with developers to create Ink First Hero apps, is their quote. Oh, sweet mother of pearl. Ink First, which probably just means, you know, they're going to have a big focus on pen input, so all these things are coming with. Oh, that sounds fun. So when people buy the cheapest possible stylus and the cheapest possible tablet and your app doesn't work right and you have to. Because it will be a race to the bottom like it always is with these things. Absolutely. It'll be. Well, the carriers need something to give away to get you to sign that extra data plan. Oh, man. I wonder how that how bad this is going to go. In some ways, I've always felt Android is actually a better tablet platform. I agree with that. I've liked iPhone with iOS and I've liked Android on a tablet. I've always thought that was nice. Well, I see for me, Android would be great on the tablet as a like an internal enterprise tool for customers, right? Developed to Android, which is what I do a lot with the Surface right now. The problem is that the minute you give them the Android option, everybody's looking at the cheapest tablets they can find. And your your code end, ends up having to apologize for whatever crap they bought on AliExpress. So Yeah, absolutely. I've had some great apps that just run absolutely horrible on cheap Android tablets. You know, I was chatting actually with uh, some folks last night at the meetup uh, and how kind of funny it it is cheaper these days. If you want to get, say, the Magic Keyboard with an iPad, you're just better off getting a MacBook Air, a low-end MacBook Air. It's cheaper to get a Mac than it is to get a fully decked out iPad tablet these days. Well, Uh, that's got to be why Apple's iPad sales are down. And I'd like to know how Google is going to solve that problem. Because Chromebooks are essentially sort of offering the same kind of value story. So the only real way I could see them offering something competitive there is if they tried to make them cheap. They're either going to go the pro route and make them way too expensive, or they're going to have to do the race to the bottom. They're going to make them cheap. There's no way they're not. Yeah, when they say they're working with OEMs. Yeah, OEMs are are bad people doing bad things for bad reasons. Google doesn't work well, do they? They just are broken. Uh, Google's not good at making hardware. You know what? They were good at making Wave, and they killed it. God damn it. Wow, nice. Another one. Every week. You're on a streak. I love it, dude. That's fantastic, I have to say. Yeah, I'm just surprised that there's no mechanism internally that that sort of checks this stuff. At least it seems outwardly there isn't. They they, they bought Motorola at one point, and they were like, oh, no, what are we doing? This is crazy. (laughs) You would hope internally, right? They've looked and said, okay, when we did Honeycomb, which... Right. These are back like Android three, Android four days. It's three. Honey, honeycomb is three. They just had a bump, right? Honeycomb is 3.x, which is important because it, it ended up diverging quite a bit from from main. Right. So that's that's why this is bad. Right. There's like a whole UI change right around then. It's it's a big divergence. Yeah. I'll put it to you that way. Yeah. You got to hope internally. They said, OK, team, what did we do wrong? Back then you forked it. Yeah, and then they just repeated that mistake, though. Yeah. I mean, and but in all fairness, obviously, iPad OS is a fork, right? But they did that at a time when they were developing the OS, and when they announced the next version, they announced that they were separating the OSs, right? They did it at release time, where this is mid-cycle. They are forking mid-cycle, which means... Android 13 will be a totally different thing, and there will still be Android 12L users out there. Yes, but I okay. So iPad OS is a fork, but that often remerges with the main, right? I would say iPad OS is a fork on layers. Android, the way they seem to have done it, is honeycomb, for lack of a better word, or Android tablet, is effectively its own layer. It's like the Huawei derivative of Android, right? It's it's like its own thing. It's so far. I mean, iPad OS 15 point whatever and iPhone OS 15 point whatever are, are super close to each other. You know there's a bunch of Git merges there that have happened over and over again, right? Hey, oh, oh, man. What an, what an embarrassment. I kinda, I'd be curious, though. You know, I'll, I'll watch. I'll, I'm going to keep an open mind. If they could come out with an iPad Pro-like tablet that had a good quality keyboard, some decent apps, you know... Uh, I, I'd consider it. I would love it. I mean, for these enterprise cases, I would much rather be doing Android than Windows for reasons of, uh, you know, good Windows tablets. There's like three. They're all made by Microsoft. There you go. I think these iPad sales are cyclical. Last night, my wife was kind of giving me a hard time because she would like an iPad with an LTE connection because 
she's doing mobile care now uh, after the COVID shutdown. So she's now doing where she's going out to see clients. And so she'd love to have uh, an iPad for her chart notes instead of having to take a tablet. And she's like, you know, I've, I've expected you, I expected by now you would have <laughs> upgraded your iPad. Cause I've had this thing since 2018. I got the 2018 iPad pro and it's just been such a solid little tablet that I haven't needed to buy it. I know you're in a similar situation. I think a lot of people out there bought in 2018 because that's when they kind of redid the design too. And I think the sales drop off until Apple really releases a pretty substantial upgrade. And that last one was close, but it's still not quite enough. I get more and more years out of these iPads than I do out of a laptop. And that's got to affect the sales as well. And so I am looking for a tablet because my wife would like one for what she does. So we'll see. Either I'll end up getting one and she'll take mine or maybe one of these Android ones will come out and she'll like that. Keep my eye out. I do think there is a long-term use case for them. They're not updated as frequently because it's just a slower market. And for people that are using it, it's a like more low-key usage. I want to say thank you to our Coder QA members. The new Coderly has been put together by Drew and will be out later this week. So if you would like to sign up, you get access to that and all previous Coderly reports. Go to coderqa.co, or you can become a network member and support all the shows. It's a great way to help us stay independent. And anytime we can diversify the income of the network and make sure that a as large as possible percentage comes from the audience, that is a financial incentive to always just remain absolutely focused on making our audience happy because they're the ones paying the bills. I think it's the best way to fund media personally. If I could, it'd be the only way media was funded, but we're not there yet. But you can help us get a little bit closer at coderqa.co or jupiter.party for the whole network. Well, Mr. Dominic, is there anywhere you'd like to send people before we wrap up this week? Follow me on Twitter at Dumanuko. And if you are in Florida and want to be a Python developer, you should let me know. Hmm. Hmm. Very nice. Contact the show at coder.show slash contact. You can subscribe at coder.show slash subscribe. If there's an episode you liked, send it to a friend. Word of mouth is the best way to help a podcast grow. And we're always appreciative of that, too. It's a great way to support the show without spending a dime. But, of course, we're just grateful you listen and download as well. And we'd love to have you join us live. We do it on Mondays at noon Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern at jblive.tv. You can hang out in our chat room, help us title it, do a little pre-show. Sometimes we get on some topics like we did this week, and we get a good discussion going. Anyways, we'll wrap it up there. Thanks so much for joining us on this week's episode of the Coda Radio Program. And we'll see you right back here next week.